welcome to Misha's Journal Podcast, where I reveal what the Lord is saying through dreams, visions, and testimonials. Today's topic is Bear Light Part 3. Yes, so I am doing a part three to Bear Light. The Lord would love me to expand on uh, what he has been speaking to us about, instruction and everything else um, pertaining to the order of Melchizedek, the, uh, pertaining to our promised land. And he wanted me to just expand on it further. And if he's having me do a part three to this, it must be very important to him. And now I wanted to, I went back um, and wrote down some notes. I went back to it so that I could um, give you all the nuggets that I wrote down for me. And so I just feel led to do this. Um, so I have some great um, content for you as well as a handful of scripture um, that I received and it just all marries together and goes hand in hand. And so this is um, what I wrote down on going further and higher. So going further and higher. So here we go, I'm gonna dive right in. So prepare now on this side of eternity before we enter the promised land. Eternity, live forever. Now, these are notes that I've written down, like I said, um, so they're not, um, I can just explain as I go, but if it's self-explanatory, then it, then I, I'll just keep going. So it says eternity, live forever, eternity in Christ. If we truly live in Christ, there is no death. So we have immortality teaching is false. So I wrote this down because there are um, some false teachings out there and it's the Lord is putting emphasis on um, immortality teaching and how false it is. Please don't believe in the new age, whoever is teaching on immortality, um, living forever. That, that's just please use this sermon and talk to the Lord um, and speak to him about what's true and what's not. Immortality teaching is false. OK, so they who did not prepare, crucify, crucify their flesh. Um, they who did not prepare, crucify your flesh, die in the wilderness. Okay, so the ones that did not prepare um, in the book of Moses or the book of Exodus uh, with Moses, they died in the wilderness. If we could remember that they died um, because they weren't prepared. They were complaining. They were grumbling and murmuring. Um, so it says our soul is full of darkness and cannot enter into the promised land of light without adjustments. So these are instructions that the Lord is giving us so that we can enter in. If we don't have these specific things, I know that I was saying prepare and I was saying, um, you know, key points like we're supposed to be preparing and, and in the order of Melchizedek. And we, we need to know what the, these things mean. So I guess I'm expanding on that and being specific um, this time about all of these things. And so our, our soul, I'll read that again, our soul is full of darkness and cannot enter into the promised light, land of light without adjustments. So there is a place of outer darkness that is not hell, but a place of regret. So um, I wrote this out because um, there is, there are, if you've read um, Rick Joyner's book on um, the, uh, oh Lord, did I forget what that book was called? Let me see. I'll get this. No worries. I just have to look it up. <laughs> okay, it's called The Final Quest. So Rick Joyner's book on The Final Quest. Um, I I read that. If you haven't read it, you have to to go and go ahead and read it or get the audio book or whatever it is. I do have the audio book, um, and 
it's pretty amazing. Um, it tells you exactly what's going on in the spirit realm. How everything is really in the spirit realm. It, it just, it breaks everything down. And the things that you're going through here in the natural, it just makes it so much sense. It's like, I'm so glad that he... He wrote those, uh, that book and, and several others as well. And so to give us a better understanding of what's going on in the spirit realm. Okay, so um, one of the things that they speak about is, um, when I say they, I mean Rick Joyner um, and other apostles and prophets. They speak about there being different levels in heaven. Um There is a lower level in heaven that where people were great. They don't speak their name, but they were great, like mega church leaders types. I'm not going to say they're mega church leaders like all of them, but they were mega church leader types and they just had pride and they had different things going on with them. And they thought that they were doing work for the Lord when they were just, it was selfish ambition, but they did make it. They repented, but then they ended up in the lower of the three levels in, in heaven. And so they have the middle level there. Um, and then there's a highest level where, oh, wow, this is amazing. Um, he talks about they have a, they get a crown and a, and a throne. They have a, a throne, a chair, and they get to um, be seated on a throne, on a throne with a crown. I think they're near the elders, the 24 elders. It's just the highest honor. And it would be a woman that just took great care of her kids and that lived poor, and but just instilled the love of Christ in them. These people get the highest honor. Just really moves me. It moves, moves my heart, moves my spirit. It's the heart of God, you know? It's like not the biggest name and the person that just did the most and won the most souls. It's just the humility of a person. And there was another person that um, that was highlighted that <sighs> kind of don't even know how to tell this story. But long story short, he would do his best with what he was given and he just the fact that he did his best was better than it was just like the parable of the woman that gave all she had and next to a rich person or a wealthy person that gave only a maybe a fourth it was a lot of money but maybe it was a fourth she gave all she had and therefore her reward was greater. And so it's these people um, that the Lord rewards th with the highest honor. And as we know, I don't know if you know this or not, but children do inherit the kingdom of heaven. And so, yeah, they're, they have dominion over, over that the kingdom of heaven, which is just shows you the heart of God, doesn't it? It shows you his heart. What an amazing father. His ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. Okay, let me move on here. So he prepares the most can attain the highest and first prize that crucified their flesh. Okay, that's what I spoke on. Now, these are just notes. Um, so... They kind of sound weird, but I'll just expand on them as I go. So we, I just spoke on that, um, how the highest honor gets the first prize, the, those that crucify their flesh. So those that crucify their flesh, they get the highest honor. The, those that prepare the most get the highest honor. Okay, so that's important. So we cannot afford to let our guard down. This is a, that's a big one. We can't afford, not now, not in this time, 
not in this uh, this this window of time that we have right now. We cannot afford to let any any anything get to us. We can't afford to let our guard down. We can't afford to go backwards. We can't afford to go to the left or the right to go before God. We have to be all the way inside of his will doing exactly what we're supposed to do. It's crunch time. And so it says win the battle in our mind in every battle. So win every battle and especially win the battle in your mind. So winning the battle in your mind is something that that takes um it takes training and so the, the um if you've been in training um or if not uh then th- please pray for for the lord to help you with this um if he's probably already started you <laughs> if he i've been in training with the battlefield of the mind and getting strengthened in different ways and so um that's necessary very necessary the enemy likes to attack us in our mind so it's very necessary for us to be trained and to continue to sharpen our minds um okay so i have let's see how many points do i have about eight points here so the number one is put away flesh lusts evil things according to first corinthians 10 and 6 so put away flesh and lusts, lust of the flesh and evil things, according to 1 Corinthians 10 and 6. Uh, number two, the greatest stumbling block um, is disobedience. <sighs> Huge nugget, okay? Um, the Lord loves our obedience over most things, over, over most anything, if we are, I mean, just the um, saw came to my mind. If, as I as I said that saw came to my mind, he was not obedient. You can see the contrast between him and David. David, uh, he used to ask the Lord for every little thing, even when after he won a battle, and he's like, okay. Lord, should I go into battle again? Will I win? Because if not, you know, he just checked on, ch- checked to see. He didn't just go arrogantly. Saul did the opposite. He just did what he wanted. He did consult the Lord at times, but he wasn't obedient. He went in, he took the plunder when the Lord told him not to do something or through Samuel, right? When the Lord told uh, Samuel to tell Saul not to do something, uh, he gave clear instructions and, and Saul did not take heed. He didn't, he did not o- obey. He was not obedient. And the Lord quickly just, he said, I'm looking for somebody else right now because I'm not, I'm not about to tolerate disobedience. So yes, the Lord will not tolerate disobedience. So this is the greatest stumbling block. Okay. And so we've been overly desensitized. This is a side note. We've been overly desensitized and there's no fear of the Lord. So um, one thing that I'd like to do is I have a prayer manual that we have with our church and I will pray. um, We have this section that we pray um, that uh, has scripture on the fear of the Lord. And I will pray that over the body of Christ, over myself, over my family, over my loved ones and over all of us. I pray for the fear of the Lord, even to the lost. Because it's one of the most important things that we can have, the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord causes you to walk in obedience. It's everything. This actually should be at the top of the, the very top, having the fear of the Lord. So if you don't have enough of the fear of the Lord, pray for it. Pray for the Lord to instill, instill the fear of the Lord. Now, don't mistakenly say Uh, the spirit of fear say the spirit of the fear of the lord (laughs) okay let's make sure we get that part right okay and then next point um pray for the spirit of the fear of the lord okay number three um put away unbelief Uh, according to first corinthians 10 and 7 so put away unbelief unbelief um basically it's just a slap in the face to the lord 
um, you're just saying he can't do it. God can do all things. And we can do all things through him, through Christ, who strengthens us, right? So um, when we have doubt and unbelief, we're saying that he cannot do all things. Okay, number four, put away distrust, uh, complaining and grumbling, just like the children of, of Israel in um, on the way to the promised land. Now, these are points um, that were taken from the book of Exodus on their way to the promised land. So these are very key points to um, being in a divine alignment with with the Lord concerning us on our way to our promised land. And actually, um, on one of my episodes, I said that we were already there. So we are, we're, we are in our promised land, but, um, yes, we are in our promised land right now, but, um, we're at the point of where we're about to take the city. (laughs) We're there. We see it. Um, it's right in front of our faces. So we need to not give in to unbelief, just like uh, the, the reports that were given. Uh, and uh, from one, I think there were um, there were two reports given and one report was negative. One report was positive. And so don't believe the bad report. Don't believe the negative report. Just um, put away distrust, put away complaining and grumbling. According to Matthew 6 and 33 to 36. Okay, so number five, put away corruption of lips. Um, The grumbling and complaining. The Lord hates complaining so much. I have uh, what came to mind was. um, I don't remember the exact story, but it was when I think it was further along into the wilderness after they just left uh, from Egypt and they were just complaining about not having their stick of manna and they wanted meat and then the Lord just poured down these birds and then he killed the people because they were just (laughs) just the the Lord's anger they angered the Lord they angered the Father and he just yeah, we don't want, we don't, we don't want to uh, walk after their footsteps, right? So let's not uh, grumble and complain. And they were just, we just, we, our God loves us. We need to trust him. We need to respect him with our lips, our words, our actions. We, we need to, to make sure that we have these things in line and not be upsetting, not upsetting our father that is going to bring us to this place. I mean, he, he's bringing us to this place that is flowing with milk and honey, right? So we need to be mindful of not complaining, grumbling, and being corrupt. And it says a flow edification to bless. So we need to um, use our mouth to bless. We need to use our mouth to edify. And I am about to make sure that I'm doing this diligently because I just recently found out the things that you teach on are the things that you're super tested on. So I'm going to be tested like crazy on this. So, And it's okay. I need to practice it anyway. So, um, yeah. So we need to edify and to bless with our mouth and not curse with it. So number six, sexual immorality equals the standard is lowered. Okay. Let me see what this means. The pastor does the same as the member. Oh, okay. So this is why I wrote this down. So if a leader or a teacher or a person with leadership in leadership has issues with sexual immorality, then the people under him, their flock, the people that that serve, that they that they are serving, that are under them, that they're overseeing, if they see that they're doing this, they think it's okay. And this is all not okay. It's all not okay. It's not okay for leaders 
anybody else for that matter to live in sexual immorality. We cannot compromise. We can't compromise. And living in sexual immorality, we can't. It says, do not compromise the body. That was the point that I wrote next to that. Number seven, put away not following the Lord. Um, we need to be disciplined in every area of our life. Um, so I know that, um, I guess what came to mind just now was <clears throat> you may follow the Lord in this area and that area, but you don't follow the Lord in other areas of your life. Um, when it comes to relationship, like it's a whole nother thing. I, I know that uh, some people think that that's okay and they've lived life like that. They don't know anything else. Um, they think that, okay, I this is my, this is religion on this side and then this is my love life and it's separate. No, everything is all inclusive in our walk with God. He is the head and the family is under Christ and everything should revolve around the Lord. Everything. We have to put him first. We have to love him before we love anyone else. Even before we love ourselves, we have to love the Lord. We love the Lord first. <clears throat> um, number eight. They were not able to enter into the promised land because of these things. So these are all the things that they were not able to enter into the promised land for. Um, everything that I've spoken. So even if baptized, saved and saved in fellowship, they lost their salvation. So it's not um, you can't lose your uh, you can be saved and born again. But if you're not living, if you're living a carnal life in willful sin, then you're not saved. So you you don't have a salvation. You don't have salvation. You have to rededicate your life. And that means turning your life to God, turning your life fully. You can't just live in willful sin and saying, oh, you were saved a while ago, that it doesn't matter. You you. You are not, you are not saved at that point. You're not saved at that point. Anybody could, you say it with your mouth and don't believe it in your heart. Anybody could say, oh, I'm, I'm a Christian and then go live like the world. I've seen that so many times. You can't live that way. And so if you didn't know, I say all of this in love. And um, with all love and humility, I say this because I want everyone to get it. I want everyone to get it and I want everyone to, to, to be exactly where they're supposed to be. We have, we have things that we need to do. We have, we have to get ourselves in, in, in position. And so these are the, the points that I wrote down. They're very good nuggets. And so um, the last thing I wrote, they were held accountable. So all of these things that I've spoken to you, you are now held accountable, uh, just as I am, of knowing these things. So, and it's, it's a good thing. It's a good thing um, to hold yourself accountable for the things of God, you don't want to be ignorant because people perish for lack of knowledge. So we want to know these things. And so the last point I wrote down on this, the last note I wrote was Moses was disobedient and unable to enter into the promised land because of these things. And so let's see, we have heard Okay, let me go on. I wrote some more points here. So we have heard a lot from God and therefore are held accountable and will be expected of it will be expected of us. So we are chosen of God and always seekers of the Lord. So we need to always be seekers of the Lord if we're chosen of God. 
predestined, chosen, and sent. We are predestined, chosen, and sent. Pruning, cut away all that does not bear fruit. So God does this and we need to do this. We need to crucify our flesh. Um, how to live righteously. Precepts, judgment. We've been recalled to this call. We have, re we have been recalled to this call. Call to a higher calling. So... <clears throat> Uh, towards the whole nation so we are examples we are just we're living walking breathing examples and so we need to be examples um we are also disciple makers so i remember i spoke about us um having home churches so we're going to start doing that and we need to the lord wants to prepare us and get us ready for home ministries so um i wrote notes about that and uh, we need to be ready now for home ministries. We need to be practicing this now. And it says, I will become a priest. And it's a sacrifice. Yes, we are to become priests. Remember, I spoke about this so many times. We are to be priests and not just priests like Aaron, but uh, priests and kings, like in the order of Melchizedek. Now I'm about to get into this qualifications of a priest. And so the priest offer incense number one number two they know how to minister unto god fellowship they stay near to the lord the presence of the lord so they're always in the presence of the lord positioning themselves in the presence of god to linger there we need to learn how to get in the presence of the lord um go through the stages you know go through i've, I've been there we've all been there where it's hard at first but you get in there and you, you start spending more and more time and then you want to start lingering there you want to stay there um, number three, learn to wait in the presence of God, to hear from him. So once we're there, we have to learn to hear what he's saying. Uh, Melchizedek priesthood order. Make our home a holy place, a temple for God. So we are to make our home his temple. And um, if you live with others that don't share your views, um, I know it could be tough, but you just work with what you have. Do your best and pray for them. I just um, uh, listened to uh, uh, Pastor Rich, Richard Lorenzo about this. He spoke about this yesterday, or I, I heard the video yesterday. And he was talking about... Um, how to pray for family or how to pray for unbelievers, unbelievers that are your family. And he said that he went about it the wrong way at first. He used to just go to family events and then just beat them over the head with the Bible, basically. And then he said he had to stop doing that because that's a, re a religious spirit. What he started to then do is keep his distance and pray for them. And, and then one by one, they each came to the Lord. I thought that was an amazing story. That's what he said in a nutshell. But Go check that out if if um, if you're interested. I thought that was an amazing testimony, and that's what we we should do. We need to make our if that's what how your household is. If it's um, just divided with unbelievers, just start praying for them, and it can feel discouraging because he even said this: it gets worse before it gets better. It'll seem like it's getting worse before it gets better, and they will just show up at your door sometimes or. You know, they'll come to you or just just miraculously they'll change because the Lord, he honors that he honors your prayers for them. He wants you to pray for them. And I'm just a quick testimony. My family is finally coming to the Lord. My family is finally coming to the Lord. I've been praying for them for years. They used to think I was nuts or they used to think that or they used to just not want to be around me or just think I was crazy and they're finally coming to God I can't believe it I just it's been a while and I'm just now hearing these praise testimonies it's like wow all the fasting and praying is working if you really care for for whoever this is you will fast and pray for them and you will see results I I really recommend that okay so let's see the the glory of the Lord now this 
this is really uh, the part that I wanted to get to. Uh, the coming of the glory of God. Okay, so there are some things that the Lord wanted me to speak about concerning this. The glory of God. So, um, let me see. Where do I want to start here? Okay. Okay, so the Holy Spirit of the former and latter reign. So the prophecy of the former reign was fulfilled in in Jesus' time in the year 2000, or about 2,000 years ago, uh, the day of Pentecost. Now Jesus poured out his Holy Spirit upon all disciples who had all joined together in Jerusalem um, constantly in prayer for 10 days after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. Then the uh, miraculous work of Holy Spirit occurred in the early church, 3,000 people. Uh, repented in in one day (laughs) and then from then on even more souls were saved so it says in acts uh, 2 and 1 to 47 it talks about when the day of pentecost came they were all together in one place all of them were filled with holy spirit those who accepted his message were baptized and about three thousand were added to the number that day So I thought that was amazing. So this is talking about uh, the latter and former reign. This is talking about the glory of the Lord. Oh man, I'm so thirsty today. Um, So we have the, the prophecy of the latter rain coming down at the harvest time to be fulfilled through the great work of Holy Spirit, which God pours out on us the gospel work of gathering God's people who are present represented as wheat, the wheat from the ends of the earth in the spiritual harvest time. So uh, they will, according to Matthew 24 and 30 to 31, I'll read a little bit of it. They will see the son of man coming on the clouds in the sky with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. And so the um, Holy Spirit of the latter rain, which is granted at the time of the spiritual harvest, is poured out upon those who come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. So this is what I wanted to get to. This is the meat and potatoes of all of this. Uh, the, The glory of the Lord, the order of Melchizedek, the priesthood, um, the, the Feast of Tabernacles, all of this plays a role in what's about to come up. Now, the, the Feast of Tabernacles, um, you know, are the, the, the Yom Kippur, um, you know, all of the, the Hebrew feasts. If you don't have a Hebrew calendar, I suggest you look it up and, and look at all the, the, um, the, the feasts that are about to happen. They, they go on from September to mid-October. And so, uh, let's see, let me read uh, Zech. Zechariah 14 and 16 to 17. uh, Then the survivors will go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, and to celebrate uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. If any of the peoples of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, God Almighty, they will have no rain. So it's important for us to, apparently it's important for us uh, during the, these feasts. I, I think it's something that has to do with this this year, this um, uh, new year. So you know the new year just happened, uh, the, the, new, the Hebrew new year just happened, and it's year 5784. And so there's there's significance to why the Lord is having me tell you this, why I'm speaking about the feast, the glory of the Lord. I, I really do believe that we may uh, receive God's glory during, I'm not going to name dates or anything like that, but we need to get ourselves into position to receive what God is, is trying to give us and do for us right now. Um, and he's going to have the latter and the former rain at the same time. Um, and... He's 
he's about to do something huge with that has to do with um, his glory, the presence of, of God and his glory. Um, let's see. Let me read on. So now is the age of the Feast of Tabernacles, a spiritual a fruiting season when we should diligently ask Elohim who rule and manage, who rules and manage all things to give us the Holy Spirit of the latter reign. Those who come to Jerusalem and ask for her grace will be clothed with the power of Holy Spirit of the latter reign, which is seven times more powerful than the former reign given at the time of Jesus's first coming. Now, um, I, we had a speaker come to our church and tell us that when God's glory, he's going to, God's glory is going to fill the earth. And I know you, you've heard this um, from many people, many true prophets. Um, that God's glory is going to fill the earth um, before He comes back for uh, the the tribulation uh, before the tribulation before, uh, for His rapture. For um, and He's going to pour out a spirit, and there's going to be a harvest, right? And then he, there's going to be a rapture, and then the tavern, uh, the 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 tribulation is going to happen after that i do believe in the pre-trib rapture i I know that uh, a lot of people don't um but i doesn't it doesn't make sense to not have one and saying second coming second coming means he has to come a first time anyway i don't want to get into that that's just um an argument i'm not gonna i'm not willing to have i think i i don't know um a hundred percent but I do, it makes more sense if there was a rapture and it, it, it talks about the taking, it just, it speaks of it. And then people, I've heard different testimonies about people going up and one being left and one being stayed behind to go through the tribulation. It wouldn't be fair for everyone to have to go through the tribulation, even the people that are just kind of carnal and living their life whatever, however they want. Uh, with the people that are diligently going after so it it just doesn't make sense for there not to be a pre-tribulation rapture anyway uh, let's see so Jesus' first coming according to Isaiah 30 and 26 as uh, gospel workers we should accomplish the amazing work of Holy Spirit by preaching the gospel boldly being clothed with the abundance grace of holy excuse me holy spirit that heavenly father and and I'm sorry the heavenly father pours out on us on the last and greatest day of the feast of tabernacles jesus stood and said in a loud voice if anyone's thirsty let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within them, within him. Um, by this, he meant the spirit, spirit of the living God, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. And that's in John 7, 37 to 39. This is a very significant, the, the Lord highlighted the, this to me all week. John 7 and 37. I'm going to read it one more time because I don't want anything to be missed from this. So on the, I'm going to read it again for myself as well. So on the last and greatest day of the Feast of Tabernacles, the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this, he met the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Okay, I think that the Lord is speaking here. Maybe he's going to pour out his spirit. This this tremendous glory that we're going to receive during the feast during the last day of the feast who knows but there's huge significance to this he's been highlighting john 7 and 37 thank you lord let me 
me see. I think um, I'm going to look up a scripture after this too. Okay, so let me go on to Revelation 22 and 17. Uh, the spirit and the bride say, come and let him who hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, uh, let him take the free gift of water of life. Let me look up the scripture 7 verse okay okay so this has been highlighted to me just now so anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own amen and let me read before that it says Jesus answered my teaching is not my own it comes from the one who sent me Lord, you are speaking right now. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Whoever speaks on their own does does so to gain personal glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. Thank you, Lord. Wow. Okay. Thank you, Father. Okay, so let's get let's um, dive into these feasts. So I know this is um, I'm stretching this out a little bit, but these are important, and I want to get this out. So the Lord is, was highlighting the meat to this um, this to me all week, and when I saw the scriptures pertaining to this teaching, I flipped. So the Feast of Tabernacles, also known as the Feast of the Booth of uh, Sukkot, is the seventh and last feast that the Lord commanded Israel to observe and one of the three feasts that Jews were to observe each year by going to appear before the Lord and um, the Lord your God in place in the place which he shall choose Deuteronomy 16 and 16 uh, three times a year all males shall appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose at the feast of unleavened bread and at the feast of of weeks and at the feast of booths they shall uh, not appear before the lord empty-handed what does this mean lord the importance of the feast of tabernacles can be seen in how many places it's mentioned in scripture in the bible we see many important events that took place at the same time now i'm reading from uh gotquestions.org of biblical answers Okay, so in the Bible, we see many important events that took place at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. For one thing, it was at the time of Solomon's temple was dedicated to the Lord. First Kings 8 and 2. Let's see, I'm going to skip down to what is of significance. Let's see, he who believes in me as a scripture, he has said out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. John 7 and 37 to 39. There's that scripture again. Let me see. As one of the three feasts that all native born male Jews were commanded to participate in, the Feast of Tabernacles is mentioned uh, multiple times in scripture, sometimes called the Feast of the Ingathering, the Feast of the Lord, or the Feast of Booths. As one of the pilgrim feasts, when Jew, Jewish males were commanded to go to Jerusalem, it was also the time that they were brought their tithes and offerings to the temple. So we're getting what we have to, we can't come empty handed. We need to give our tithes and offerings. Maybe the Lord would like us to um, give sacrificial um, offerings at these at the feasts he wants us to give and not come empty handed I have to look into this a little more I'm not going to lie um, with the influx of people coming to Jerusalem at the time we can only imagine that the scene must have been what the scene must have been like thousands upon thousands of people coming together to remember and celebrate God's deliverance and his provision all living in temporary shelters or booths as part of the requirements of the feast during the eight eight 
uh, day period. So many sacrifices were made that it required all 24 div uh, divisions of priests to be present to assist in the sacrificial duties. Wow, these, this is jumping out at me. So we find God's instruction for celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles in Leviticus 23. And I'm not going to read... Uh, Leviticus 23. Um, if you'd like to do your uh, own in-depth study, you are welcome. Uh, let's see. So, uh, like all feasts, it begins with holy convocation or Sabbath day when the Israelites were to stop working to set aside the day for worship, uh, worshiping God. On each day of the feast, they were uh, to offer an offering made of fire to the Lord. And then after seven days of feasting, again, the, on the eighth day to be a holy convocation when they were to cease from work and offer another sacrifice to God. In Leviticus 23, last eight days, the Feast of Tabernacles begins and ends with, with a Sabbath day of rest. During the eight days of the feast, the Israelites would dwell in booths, tabernacles that were made from the branches of trees. Uh, Leviticus 23 and 40. To 42. Now I wanted to skip down to. Okay, I have to say this part. The Feast of Tabernacles, like all feasts, was instituted by God as a way of reminding the Israelites of every generation of their deliverance by God from Egypt. So that's important. Much of Jesus' public ministry took place in conjunction with the Holy Feast set forth by God. Tabernacles is symbolic of Christ's second coming when he will establish his earthly kingdom. The strong possibility that Jesus was born at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles is seen in the words of, that John wrote, John 1 and 14. I'll read it really quick. And the word became flesh and dwelt among them, among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay. The, uh, the word John, uh, the word John chose to speak of Jesus dwelling among us is the word tabernacle, which simply means to dwell in a tent. Wow. Oh, this all ties together and it's just, you can't just skip over this. This is a lot, but I, this is too much. It's just so much. You have to do your in-depth study on this. Part of God's deliverance for the Israelites was his provision and protection of them for the 40 years they wandered in the wilderness, cut off from the promised land. The same holds true for Christians today. God protects us and provides for us as we go through life in the wilderness in this world. While our hearts long for the promised land, heaven, and to be in the presence of God, he preserves us in this world as we await the world to come and the redemption that will come when Jesus Christ returns again to tabernacle or dwell among us in bodily form. Wow, that was amazing. Let's see in that. Let me see if I have any additional notes and I'm going to wrap up here. Okay, so I wrote down Melchizedek priesthood order. Make our home a holy place, temple for God. That has a whole new meaning after this. It has a double meaning, right? Physically having a temple in our home. And then uh, us within ourselves being God's holy temple. His dwelling place. Okay, and I wrote down the coming uh, glory of God. The valley of dry bones. One person became an army. Prepare them for the coming glory of God. Put away sin. So there is supposed to be a coming of glory uh, of the glory of God that is supposed to be seven times, uh, seven times 
uh, of any uh, of him filling his glory in on earth it's supposed to be seven times as much in this latter reign which is we're going to get the latter and the former at the same time per my notes as well as seven times the glory of god who god is overwhelming me right now and so it says prepare them for the coming of the glory of god filthiness and every detestable thing put away put away every sin we choose now the path of glory or the carnal christian life so if you're going to choose the path of glory the glory of god um then we are in preparation if you're going to choose a carnal christian life you are you will be a mere spectator a mere spectator you will just see all of these things going on and ooh ah that's beautiful not able to be a part of it and that's the sad part um and this is for the whole body of christ um god uses a prophet as a sign and a wonder for everyone by the grace of God, seeing and reflecting. Okay, so I wrote some points here. One to three, put away sin. Two, put away filthiness, put away filthiness. Three, every detestable abomination. God's laws are written inside of us. We will either condemn or accept our filth. Whew, my goodness. Uh, yeah, so it's... It, Basically, it's going to come up because, you know, we're we're human. We have human fleshly nature. It's going to come up. So you're either going to condemn it or you're going to accept it. Uh, what comes out defines the body. According to Galatians 5 and 17 to 21, use as a mirror. Number one to, through three. Number one, worry. It stains the soul. Number two, doubting and unbelief. This prevents entering into the promised land. Three, contouring, crossing boundaries. Um, that's what I wrote down. Um, contouring, I'm not exactly sure what that means, honestly. I just tried to do um, a quick uh, research on that, and I came to the conclusion that it means crossing boundaries. If you get something different from that, then... Um, just use discernment. Um, I wish I would have written something more down on that, but I've been super busy lately. So that's, uh, let's see. We cannot replace the covenant we made with God. So it is etched in stone. It is forever sacrificed with blood, I should say. So don't miss the high call. Uh, we cannot focus on the bad things. We cannot have bitterness in our hearts or leave any door open for the enemy to come in. Don't focus on evil reports. Um, these are abominations so that we can behold the glory and reflect the glory of God. We must be clean according to Exodus 24 and 16 to 17. However, the glory of God appears, however it appears, we must be clean. In corporate prayer, we need to be on one accord. We can't have um, any indifference. If we do, then that it just it ruins everything. It just stops um, what God is doing, and He'll move on. So we all need to be on one accord. We all need to be on the same page. There doesn't need to be any strife, any jealousy, any competition. We need to have the heart of a servant of uh, repentance. We need to clean ourselves out, basically. Go on as many fasts as possible. Just purge the flesh um, of whatever is is in us so that we can do this because we're not going to, we're either going to be right or we're going to be a spectator. We, we need to get into position now. So Exodus 19. Then it came to pass on the third day. Oh, I don't know why I wrote that. I just, I didn't finish that. I didn't finish that at all. Okay, so the glory of the Lord, the cloud, the glory cloud. Okay, so this is the last page here, and I'm wrapping up with this. So we need to be cleansed, refreshed, and renewed, according to Exodus 33 and 18, 34 and 5 to 7. How the glory of the Lord can enter or come in. John 2 and 11, glory of, the, of God is equal to the demonstration of the power of God. 
so there's a demonstration of the power of God. Um, I think that's in John 2, 11. I think that's what I wrote that for. Psalm 96 and 2 to 3, Isaiah 30 and 2 to 6. Uh, seven times the glory uh, in our lifetime, right? And so the latter rain, the latter and the former together. First um, Corinthians 12 and 8 to 10, sevenfold glory, former and latter rain together. Yes, I, I just, I couldn't believe that part. So I, I think I wrote it down a few times. Um, <laughs> the manifestation of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, healings, casting out spirits. So once we receive that, we're not just going to receive it to get a good tingly feeling. We're going to receive it so that we are able to operate in all the gifts. And it's going to be something that's um, really not what people do now. It's going to be something much greater, something we've never seen before. And I tried to get through this as quickly as possible, but without compromising the message. And I think I, I, I crammed a lot in and there's so much to take in from beginning to end. I, I don't blame you if you want to just rewind this and listen to it again. There's, it's just so jam packed with so much and just do your own study and have the Lord speak to you about it. And I'm going to um, wrap it up here and remember the Lord is always speaking, even if we aren't listening. What is he speaking to you? Thank you so much for listening and I will catch you next time. Bye.